Hello again, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Real Wealth Solutions Podcast. I am Darren Light, along with my co-hosts, Greg Scully. Today's guest is Nikolai Ray, CEO of MREX. And instead of trying to describe what that is, I'm going to let Nikolai go ahead and take it away and give us a little uh, intro bio about yourself, how you got to where you are, maybe a little bit, and then we'll just kind of take things from there. Absolutely. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Greg. Uh, it's a pleasure being here with you guys. Uh, we, we've always had a lot of fun every time we, we, we've seen each other in person, pre-COVID. Yeah, during all the conferences. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. I'm I'm due for a good bourbon and a good chat, you know, a good Absolutely. fireside chat. But uh, yeah, essentially, I'm uh, the CEO of MREX. I founded the MREX five years ago. It's a real estate. It's actually two companies. So there's one company, which is MREX Technologies, which is a, a technology startup in, in the real estate space. So MREX stands for Multifamily Real Estate Exchange. Essentially, what we're doing is... Um, it, it, you know, it's hard to explain rapidly, uh, but we're, we're building a, 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 a hub for small cap retail multifamily investors, where essentially what we're doing is creating a centralized uh, repository that allows you to access every single multifamily property that exists, access all the data on that property, and then have a suite of tools, for example, a financial modeling tool directly in the app where you don't have to go and open a big Excel spreadsheet, but you can actually just, you know, you could be in front of a, a property and be like, huh, I wonder what property that is. Open your app, press one click. It'll locate exactly where you are and see that property in front of you. You click on it. You have all the, all the information on the property. Is it being for, is it on sale right now publicly or privately? Was it sold recently? Who's the owner? What's the information on that? And there's a whole bunch of other tools that we could go into maybe a bit later, but essentially the idea is to try and create a Bloomberg terminal, but for real estate investors who are at the small cap uh, retail level, not at the mid market institutional level, like every single other real estate technology tool that exists out there. Now, the second, the second uh, part of MREX is the MREX college, which has been uh, uh, operating in Montreal for the last five years. We've had over 5,000 uh, real estate investors come through our school. And what we do essentially is, we, we teach real estate investing. And th that sounds like, that sounds very common, but in reality, it's not because real estate investing is not being taught at the moment. W what exists is there, there's, there's a spectrum. On one end, you have universities who have real estate programs, but those real estate programs are very macro, very general and uh, generic meant to, to give basic financial knowledge, basic real estate knowledge, and especially, you know, uh, develop appraisers, uh, analysts for REITs and investment banks and stuff and people like that. On the other end of the spectrum, you have mentorship and coaching programs, which, I mean, are, are great organizations just as universities are. But mentorship, mentorship and, and, and coaching is not necessarily teaching by definition. It's, it's a different thing. There's, there's a nuance that's very important to understand. And mentorship and coaching organizations are much more axed on getting you going, getting you into the action, which is a very important thing to do, and connecting you with other people because we know that real estate's a contact sport. And obviously for various reasons, like financing with Fetty, with Fannie and Freddie, where you, you kind of have to have a pre-existing relationship with Fannie or Freddie, which is impossible. So you have to partner with someone else, blah, blah, blah. So, so those organizations are doing great things. And we know many of them. I mean, we have friends, Jake and Gino, who, who, among, who among others are doing a great job but what we've done with is we've installed the MREX College kind of in the middle of that spectrum, bridging the gap between university level knowledge and research and data with real wor world application and actual on the field investing. So that's what we're doing. And uh, so far it's been, uh, it's really been, uh, as Borat would say, great success. It's been a great success. And uh, the, <laughs> the, I think people are really appreciating the very, high level knowledge that we're, we're teaching, but that's very applied. That's, you know, that, that, that is essentially applicable and it's not just theoretical. So I think that that is a great support system as well to all the coaching and mentorship programs that are out there, because I think you need coaching and mentorship, but I also think you need very high level knowledge and sophistication because the real estate market, especially multifamily over the last 10 years, 
the, the level of sophistication needed to be a successful investor has, you know, ha, ha, has essentially multiplied, you know, X times and it's only accelerating as, as time advances right now. So that's, uh, that's in a nutshell, that's what I'm doing. I was, I was a professional ice hockey player for a couple of years. I went to three Olympic games as chief of human performance, studied biomechanics, preventive medicine, uh, started a couple of companies, uh, failed the company i've had an exciting life and uh, even even if it's it's been a short one so far so and i'm also the father of three and fourth one on the way so oh wow oh, congrats, congrats man wow. i i sadly i guess we've known each other three years or so or maybe even four i did not know that's really what the exchange was for or what you had created it to be or, or was trying to get it to i guess um and now your biomechanics and olympics all that's coming back to me now um how did you identify this gap, if you will, uh, that needed to be addressed? And was it as you were getting into real estate yourself, you'd already been in real estate? How did you, how did you come about that? So, so I've been in real estate pretty much since I was about 18, just like more or less like an amateur and, you know, you know, nibbling at a couple of little properties here and there more as kind of like helping my buddies with a, a, a you know, a share of the down payment they needed to, to buy a property. I got into real estate professionally at the age of 27 uh, after my, uh, my preventive medicine and, and, and high performance career. Um, just because I'd, I, I actually, I'd built a really great company. Uh, when I, I retired from hockey at 22, I was actually playing in South Carolina, retired from professional hockey and decided to found a company based on my, my university education, which was in human performance. And uh, that company actually was, you know, was firing on all cylinders. Uh, but I, I, I built a really big company, didn't know how to manage it and operate it and kind of realized, oh, geez, I built this company. And then I tried to bring, bring people on and it ended up, you know, essentially flopping. And I went from being a hero to zero within 15 months and essentially bankrupt, a, you know, a multi-million dollar company that I built from ground up. So that brought a very severe uh, moment of, of reflection on, on my life, right? Because... I mean, that, that's a very tough thing. I ended up homeless, essentially, at, at 26. Um, and that was the second time I was homeless. I was homeless when I was probably about 10 years old. So uh, that really, you know, challenged me on what I was doing and what I wanted to do with my life. And I realized that I only went into human performance and, and preventive medicine because it was the easy way out to transition from my athletic career. Because trans transitioning from a professional athletic career or an Olympic athletic career is you know, there's a lot of empirical evidence on this, a lot of research. It's a very hard thing to do because, you know, you've been an athlete since a very young age, and that's essentially your only role and identification in society. So a lot of athletes have trouble with suicide and depression and all that. And I mean, I, I can't hide that I had trouble with, with, with definitely with depression and, and my own role in society after leaving athletics. So I realized at 27, after this big, big event, I'm like, you know what, this isn't exactly what I really love doing. Like, I don't, I don't love doing this. I'm, I'm at the Olympic level. I mean, you can see that uh, th th this is from one of the athletes that I work with at the Vancouver Olympic games. I realized that, wow, I'm at this high level. I'm 26. I'm already at an elite level as a human performance coach, like worldwide. And I'm bored out of my mind and I'm not motivated. Why? So that's when I started to, you know, to, to realize that that's not really one of what I wanted to do with my life. Like that, my athletics, it was done. I, I, I'd lived it. I transitioned out of it. That, that was it. I was ready for something more. And I'd always been passionate about mathematics, finance, economics. You know, that's why I studied biomechanics, because it was essentially a way for me to, to marry my mathematical background and, 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 and savantship with my athletic background. So I was like, okay, what's my next, what do I want to do? And, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, essentially, like distill it all down. I'm an entrepreneur. I start businesses. I like sculpting businesses. I like creating things. I like challenging the status quo. It's just kind of who I am. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go into, I'm going to go either into finance or real estate. I chose real estate because I like the, the, the tactile part of real estate that you can actually touch it. And that it's not just like, you know, kind of in the Wolf of Wall Street when Matthew McConaughey gives the whole you know, Fugazi, Fugazi speech, like real estate, you can actually go and see the property. And I really liked that. And I kind of needed that, you know, real feeling to things. So, uh, and so once I'd made that decision mentally, I actually, you know, synchronicity or call it what you want. I, I, I became friends with a real estate agent 
who had a full license to, you know, to be a, a, a broker of record and all, all that, th all that stuff. And he was already, di you know, dipping a bit in, in, in multifamily commercial. And I was like, you know what, there's something missing. I think I've been, I've been researching how everything's done in real estate. And I feel like real estate is very behind the finance world. So I think we should start an investment banking firm where we would do yes, buy side, sell side brokerage, but we do also take care of all the financing needs, both bridge, uh, uh, secured, uh, and also uh, hard money. And we would also take care of all tax, taxation, tax planning, financial modeling, portfolio management, and really offer like a, a, a holistic kind of service to real estate investors to, you know, to, to, I'd say, you know, small cap to mid market level investors. And that just took off that within three and a half years, we were doing, we were essentially doing a, a hundred million dollars in transactions a year. That business really took off. And that's how I came up with the idea of Emrex because a couple things kept on coming up. Number one, uh, I kept on realizing how hard it was to allocate capital into the multifamily real estate market because there's no centralized marketplace. There are properties on LoopNet, on Zillow, on Trulia, on MLS, pocket listings, private sales, passive sellers. Like it's, 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 it's just crazy. Like the, it feels like you're in 1864 I'm trying to find gold, right? So I was like, this, this just doesn't make sense. I have all these buyers with all this money and we're not able to find deals for them. Or if we are, it's so energy intensive and time consuming that it just doesn't make sense, right? So that was the big kind of aha moment for me. And then the second thing was like, all these REITs and these private equity funds and hedge firms, they have all this kind of data. And Greg was talking about this earlier, you know, kind of before the show about like CoStar, they have all this big raw data and they have all these analysts kind of, you know, digest that data and then help them make strategic decisions. That doesn't exist for, for, for small investors like us, right? So I was like, how can we provide data, but not just for the sake of data, but actionable insights and strategic thinking to real estate investors to help them make better decisions with regards to their next acquisition. Should they refi the property? How should they refi it? Should they sell the property? How should you release the, the apartments that are, that, that are now vacant? And, and how much money should you invest in your property? All these, all these moments in time that are so crucial in your decision-making as a real estate investor, I was just like, there, there's nothing out there that exists to help people. And then the final thing for me kind of the last nail in the coffin where I was like, okay, I'm going to sell my investment bank and do this and put my money where my mouth is. I was like, if you buy shares of Apple, like right now, open up your, your Robin hood, if you're in the U S or in Canada, well, simple, open up your, your app, you buy shares of say Tesla, you can follow in real time. How, how what, you know, how, how those shares are performing against the market, how your portfolio of shares are performing. We're putting in hundreds of thousands of dollars of our hard earned and saved money into properties, our own properties or into syndications. And there's no, there's no realistic way of actually following and tracking our portfolio and, and, and our investments. It just, it, for me, it's ludicrous. It's like, how is it that everyone's accepting this? So all those things kind of made me say, okay, I have, I have these, these problems. I think I'm smart enough with my, you know, very eclectic background and education and way and kind of, you know, rebellious way of thinking. I think I can probably, you know, find solutions to these. I have the money to do it, you know, because of the very successes I, I, I've had in life and I have the guts to do it. So, you know what, I'm going to do it. And that's how I decided to sell my investment bank, started MREX um, and then saw there was a big gap in the education. I was like, if I build all these tools, but, no one's educated or sophisticated enough to actually use them, then what's the point? So I founded the Amrex College as I did that. And yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the, the fastest I can give you that story. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, we've, we've stumbled into that gap coming from education communities, not coming up in real estate as a job and, and, and making it our, our new venture. Right. Yeah, once you start owning something, you got to operate it. And that that's where I think there's a big gap in, in the education um, is how do you actually operate these things on a day to day? 
Um, and, there, and in most partnerships, there's very few people in most partnerships that are actually involved in that process. And operating can be at the property level, but it can also be at the asset level. And yeah. I see a lot of people not operating at the property level, which is fine. I'm also a real estate investor, you know, and I, I built my own personal real estate investment holding company. We're, we're fully vertically integrated. We're a general contractor. And we, you know, we've acquired 40 properties in the last 18 months. We only do extreme value add stuff and, 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 and opportunistic stuff. So I, I'm, I also understand I'm, a, I'm first and foremost a, a professional in the investment world, but I'm also a very successful investor, but Operationally, I mean, I'm, I, I never consider myself an operational guy, like at the boots level of, of operating properties, the actual um, properties, but I'm an asset operator. And, you know, Greg, we were talking about uh, prior to the podcast, we were talking about underwriting, right? Which is one of my favorite topics. Underwriting is one of the small parts of what real estate financial engineering and globes. No one's really underwriting. Like, I, I got to be honest with people, like everyone's kind of pulling their own tails no one's underwriting worth shit because essentially underwriting should be operational. It shouldn't be just when you're looking at properties to buy. Most oh, absolutely. underwriting should be done once you've bought the property. That's yeah. operational underwriting and no one's doing that. Yeah. There's a lot of nuance with oh. you, with your lease expirations, with timing for a potential refi or whatever. Yeah. I mean, you know, to, to your models, you know, yeah. Yeah. becoming more precise, which is, you know, my, my, my motto in underwriting is stop being conservative and trying to be precise. Yeah. I want to talk about that. Cause I picked up on that because uh, there's, you know, people, Oh, we're conservative underwriters and you pick on, you know, like the exit cap rate is, is the classic one. It's like, well, it's, you know, 10 basis points for every year we hold it. And, <laughs> and that's that's the that's the rule of thumb or that's the industry yeah. standard uh, Pebble, but it's Pebble not level beach underwriting <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I mean you have to do something obviously but um you know talk a little bit more about uh precise the other word we mentioned before we started recording was defensible underwriting right. Right. versus just being conservative for the lack of being conservative and a lot of that you know to also touch on you know giving a market credit for at least its current performance and foreseeably its performance maybe for the next 18 24 months that you absolutely can re well, reliably say like hey you know we're getting seven percent rent growth in knoxville there's no supply coming on people are moving here yep. it deserves to be underwritten at something beyond uh, just three percent rent growth because that's the rule of thumb i think i think there's a couple things to unpack in in, in that subject the, the first being you know and i'm kind of a stickler for this but education that's that's why i talk about how the education is such it's so lacking in the industry because essentially if if you go on google and search for like real estate investment courses and now everyone and their mother has a real estate investment course, right? Just, a, just as everyone and their grandmother is a syndicator, a successful syndicator with thousands of units, right? Everyone is. When, you know, and I like to kind of make fun of that. And there are a lot of great syndicators and a lot of great educators out there. But, you know, there, there's a lot that aren't. And what you realize is that everyone has all these courses and they're all kind of, and everyone's writing all these articles because now Gary Vaynerchuk told everyone to generate, you know, gazillion pieces of content and that's the, the path to success. And I'm not saying that it's not the path to success for some, um, but uh, if you start reading articles that people are putting out or posts or podcasts or courses, you realize everyone's just kind of repeating what the last dude said, right? And no one's actually, no one actually is coming from a place of actual reflection and, and, and critical thinking attached with real you know a real knowledge base everyone's kind of just spitting what the other dude said and then because everyone's spitting what the other dude said it's it's creating like this huge confirmation bias where everyone's kind of you know jerking each other off to, to be kind of raw <laughs> and so everyone thinks they're all right right <laughs> and everyone all thinks they're geniuses when they all when no one knows what the hell they're talking about and the example of the the exit cap rate which is a commonly accepted methodology right now among all these people uh, is 
Well, you know, like you said, we'll, we'll add 10 basis points to the cap rate. So let's say we purchased at five. Well, then, you know, that means if we project a five-year exit, our exit will be based upon a 5.5 cap rate. Uh, and then all your underwriting and your metrics and your KPIs are based off of that. I mean, you might as well have just like invented anything and just put anything on paper and be like, you know, this is how it's going to work because that means absolutely nothing. It's based off of nothing. Now, I think that's where, you know, I, I, I think data, data is one thing, but thinking is another thing. And that's where I kind of challenge people to, to, you know, step out of all this for a moment and actually think about this. And there's an analogy that I really like. It's uh, and I might butcher this, but I apologize for, for everyone if I do. Um, there, there was a study done on uh, 10 chimpanzees. So they put them all in this lab. They put a ladder in the middle of the lab with a bunch of bananas. And they put uh, electrical collars around all the chimps. Now, the first time a chimp went to try and go get the bananas, they electrocuted the nine other ones. So after a couple of times, due to the Pavlovian effect of, you know, classic conditioning and psychology, um, the, other, the minute one of the chimps went to go up the ladder, the nine other ones were like, eh, I don't want to get electrocuted. So they all got up and beat the crap out of the 10th the chimp, right? So they continued this experiment and eventually took one of the chimps out of the lab and put in a new chimp. Now, this new chimp doesn't have a collar. So the new chimp gets in the lab and he's looking at the other chimps and he's like, dude, what's going on, right? You know, like, this, why are you eating those bananas? They're right I, grew up in <laughs> I, I apologize. I'm a Californian Canadian, right? So I, I like to use kind of West Coast lingo sometimes. They're like, dude, you know, there's bananas. What are you idiots doing? I'm going to go and eat all those bananas. And the minute he gets the ladder, boom, you know, he, he just gets, you know, pummeled upon by the, the nine other chimps. And then the scientists slowly replace every single one of the original chimps. Now you have 10 new chimps who don't have collars, who were never electrocuted, were not there at the beginning, and no one's going for the bananas. And they're all just sitting there like a bunch of monkeys, right? A bunch of mindless monkeys sitting there. No one knows why. And that's what everyone's doing in the real estate investment world. Mm. Everyone's just repeating a bunch of shit from a bunch of monkeys who were electrocuted with, without knowing why. And the bananas are just kind of hanging there <laughs> and everyone's acting like they were all electrocuted. So I think that's why I'm trying to like to be devil's ad, the devil's advocate and, and, and kind of challenge people into opening their mind and their thought process and their decision-making into not following into you know, uh, platitudes and rules of thumb and these kind of, you know, these knowledge bases that essentially come from they come from nowhere. Like some dude probably, you know, 10 years ago with a bit of a following before followings existed, you know, thought, hey, this is a really, you know, great way to, to teach, you know, what you should do with the cap rate because, you know, no one knows what to do with the cap rate. And then that dude, you know, probably gay started giving some seminars. And then that just kind of distilled into the population of, of real estate investors. And then a couple of those investors had success because the market was, you know, was, was on their side. So they all became successful. They all became teachers. They're teaching what that dude told them, plus what they learned from the market, but they were only in a very favorable market. So they have, you know, survivorship bias. So you have confirmation bias and survivorship bias driving the market. <laughs> and people are just kind of doing, you know, anything that it just, it's, it's not defensible. Like, like well, yeah. And then how many of these people have actually gone full cycle on something yeah. either? It's not know, defensible. It's like, and they're saying, well, I'm conservative. Okay. Why is that conservative though? And then they're like, well, cause it's conservative. Well, okay. But why is it conservative? Well, because if cap rates expand, well, then I won't be in a bad decision. Okay. But what if cap rates, what if cap rates compress? What if they stay the same? What if they expand, but less? What if they expand but more? Uh, and then you see this kind of like this blank kind of, you know, this blank face that they make. And you're like, okay, so you're not being conservative. You're saying you're being conservative, but that's not what conservative is. We should strive to be precise. And in that precision and that striving to be, because you can't be precise. It's impossible. We're projecting, we're gambling. That's what we're doing. We're placing bets. 
I think poker is a great analogy to real estate investment. There's a great book by Andy Dukes, world champion, who, who I think, uh, you know, wrote a great book on placing bets. And there's a lot of analogies and parallels that you can make to real estate investing. Howard Marks talks about this a lot, the great uh, uh, distressed bond investor um, of, of how essentially what you're trying to do as an investor is you're trying to play the probabilities. So you're trying to place bets that are the most probable, probable and on the macro, you end up winning because you're playing the probabilities, right? So by doing that, you're trying to be as precise as possible with regards to probabilities, but that's all forward projecting. So you always all have to update that operationally because as you get closer to an end date, your projection becomes more precise, right? Yep. So if you're just underwriting prior to acquisition based on a five-year exit and you're not, you're not underwriting and updating that model as time advances, well, you're neither precise and you're not conservative. Like you're not even close to being conservative. And in that underwriting, you should always underwrite different scenarios. Like you shouldn't underwrite an expansion of the cap rate. You should underwrite a light expansion, a heavy expansion, a light compression, a heavy compression. You should underwrite a, sta a stability of cap rates. Then you should also do the same thing for interest rates. Then you should also do the same thing for NOI. And then among all those scenarios, yes, you could choose to base your strategy on the most conservative of those scenarios. And that, that you will always update and then always choose the conservative of all those scenarios that are always being updated. That's conservative underwriting. Adding 10 basis points to the cap rate upon acquisition for your model to get investors or to justify buying a property is not even close to conservative underwriting. It's, it's nothing. It's, it, that's Fugazi or Fugazi or whatever the hell it is. I say Fugazi, but I don't know if either one is right. <laughs> so, so I'm going to... So it's not just knowing how to underwrite, because I, I do a lot of underwriting analysis for our team and I struggle with, I'm trying to predict the future yeah, it's a hard all the time. And, you know, it, it's, uh, and I'm a firm believer that we have virtually no control over most things in life um, without getting on a full tangent about that kind of mentality. But um Got to play the odds. That's why all. Oh well, you... yeah, I mean, so you 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 want to be able to under. I don't want to be able to underwrite. I want. I need to be able to underwrite in Washington County, Tennessee, specific to the city that it's in, as well for property tax nuances and stuff. It's not just underwriting. It's understanding pre precisely to what you are looking to acquire, because that goes back to maybe entry level underwriting education is like property taxes, you know, your expenses are going to increase 3%. I'm like, not if you're, not if you're in Texas, yeah. you know, they're going to be increasing at a far different rate than right. exactly. here in Washington County when they're reset every four years and it's much less of a headache for us. So yeah. an insurance, like an insurance. Yeah. The last year and a half insurance on properties, I mean, have essentially increased by, you know, <laughs> at least 20 to 30% in a lot of cases, you know? So if you're on a road with the insurance that the seller had, well, you're in for a bit of a surprise on your NOI once you actually buy the property. And, you know, uh, you were talking earlier, Greg, about, uh, uh, you know, if Knoxville has 7%, you know, rent growth. And we're making that number up. I'm not sure what yeah, it is. Yeah, we're making that up. <laughs> that's arbitrary, arbitrary number. But let's say Knoxville has 7% rent growth or, or Phoenix, like Phoenix in the last couple of years was probably at around, I believe, eight or nine percent. And you're underwriting rent growth that just simply um, uh, is, is 50 percent over inflation. So let's say it's about two and a half, three percent rent annual rent growth. Well, no wonder you thought that Phoenix was way too expensive and didn't buy anything like, duh, <laughs> your, your underwriting is like way off. You're underwriting for for a completely different type of market. Right. You should have been underwriting for that. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be doing, you shouldn't be underwriting scenarios where that rent growth might taper or might actually, you know, contract. But if you're just underwriting that the rent growth in Phoenix for that property is going to be 3% every year in a very linear and flat way. Well, I got news for you. You're never going to buy shit in Phoenix. Right. So you're not a real estate investor. What are you doing? You're on forums, you're on bigger pockets and you're, you know, in conferences and you're talking a big game, but you're not investing. And that, that's another big important thing. I have a very good friend who's a brilliant, brilliant guy who sold everything in 2014. 
because it was going to crash. Everything to him, everything was going to crash. Dude hasn't bought anything in seven years. He's not a real estate investor. I got to tell you, and, and and I love the guy, and he's brilliant, but he's not a real estate investor. He's made a, he's made a huge mistake in my eyes because he's forgot something. We have a finite time to invest. We're on a, we're all going to be dead sooner or later, right? So there's something called time value of money, which is a a basic concept in finance. So, you know, if you're not, if you're not investing, always investing kind of dollar cost averaging, even in markets and cycles that you think are kind of, you know, towards the end of the game, you you still have to kind of dollar cost average and, and, and keep in mind that you have an obligation to allocate the capital that you have and at least generate some returns because otherwise something called inflation is going to eat that money, right? And now we now now people are finally understanding what inflation is. Like now now we're living inflation. You know we've been living it for a while. People are just you know they, they just don't understand economics properly. Um, but you know that that that's that's a whole other discussion as well. Hey, it's Greg from Real Wealth Solutions. If you'd like to know more about our passive income opportunities, jump on to realwealth.solutions and hit that schedule a call button. We're always happy to talk about our multifamily and flip projects and to answer any questions you may have. Again, that's realwealth.solutions. We look forward to hearing from you. And now back to the podcast. Let's talk more. I want to more, golly, this exchange, this technology tool that you've created. And I'll just, total transparency, I did not realize that's what this, the leg of this that you had as well, or what the function of it was. So are you telling me that with this tool, I actually have the ability or could have the ability to, uh, as you say, track my Tesla real estate stock almost real time, taking into my KPIs, my rents, my all this, as you say, operational 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 underwriting. All the financial metrics, all the asset level. Uh, financial KPIs. So obviously yeah. it's not a property management app there. And, you know, there are a lot of property management tools and apps that exist out there that you can kind of track more of that operational property level KPIs. Mm-hmm. But yes, essentially one of the features in the terminal, it's called the MREX terminal. Um, there's a, 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 you can actually sign up for the pre-launch uh, on uh, app.mrex.co. So app.mrex.co. And uh, uh, we show a little bit of what we're doing, not much, because we want to kind of stay shadowy for, for now. We're, we're looking to launch the beta in the U.S. probably around beginning of 2022, so beginning of January. And, uh, but essentially, one of the major features, there, there, currently there are three major features. We're in beta up here in, in French Canada, in, in Montreal. Uh, so we have about 50 investors on the app right now. And uh, one of the major features is the portfolio manager. So what it allows you to do is essentially track the asset level KPIs of, of your property, individual properties, and of your overall portfolio. And uh, the two, the three, well, the two other major features, one is essentially a, an underwriting tool, a watch list and an underwriting tool it is like nothing that exists on, in the world. I developed it with one of our professors who is an actuary, who is an international fellow in, in actuarial sciences. We built probably one of the most robust Excel underwriting spreadsheets that exist in the world, and we managed to put it in an app, <laughs> which was which was quite a lot of work. <laughs> We've been on that for about two years. It was, a, a, it was just a, a, an Everest type kind of you know endeavor, and it's quite functional right now. It's 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 out of this world. Like like it can help someone who doesn't have much financial underwriting uh, experience actually underwrite properties, and it can also help very advanced underwriters like myself you know, be very mobile and kind of not stuck to my, to, to, to my screens at my office. I can be in front of property and already start underwriting the property. And the other feature is that we've centralized the whole marketplace. So for example, here in Quebec, which is the equivalent of a state for Americans, it's a province, um, there's about 60,000 apartment buildings. So five units plus. What we've done is we've created a, essentially a search engine that allows you to search every single of those 60,000 properties. And then once you end up on the property that you're searching for, uh, 
it shows its status. Is it being is it being sold right now by a broker on one of the various public platforms? Is it being sold by a, a, a set, a, an owner directly on one of the one of the uh, you know direct to owner platforms? Uh, is is it a pocket listing for a broker or a wholesaler wholesaler or is it just not for sale? And then once you're on the property, you can see all the historic information of that property. Every time it was transacted, the annual appreciation in between its transactions benchmarked against the area it's in. Same thing for the rent growth, same thing for a whole bunch of other KPIs. You can take that property, put it in your watch list with one click and then start underwriting the property. Um, you can share it with your partners, with your GPs. And uh, we've also created, I guess, a fourth feature, which is essentially uh, a very robust information and news network where all we do is write articles about the actual real estate investment world. So kind of like a Bloomberg, and I, I you know, I, I, I've essentially inspired, a, I've been very inspired by what Bloomberg did in the financial markets. I'm trying to essentially do that in the real estate markets. So we already have, you know, full-time uh, uh, journalists on staff writing articles. Uh, we have expert analysis, like every time a property is put on sale, whether it be an eight unit property or a 400 unit property, we have people like me actually in real time analyzing that property. Kind of like what, you know, a Motley Fool does with the analysis of stocks and then kind of give, giving you, you know, buy signals or, or trading ideas. We're kind of doing the same thing for real estate investors who, you know, are kind of under that 500 to 1,000 unit mark and over the five unit mark. Well, one thing I've learned since I've been doing this, one of the things that uh, you learn is that your investors want to be communicated to on a regular basis, weekly, if you can do it. They, they're all about weekly, if you can do it. And I see this tool as being like the difference maker in setting yourselves apart from all the other chimps out there doing the same thing, if you will. Absolutely. I think it's uh, amazing. Uh, yeah, I, I and the, the idea is also like our, our basic mission is to democratize real estate investing. Like that, that's, that's the basic goal of what I'm doing because, you know, I grew up poor and I don't hide it from anybody. I grew up poor. I grew up in, in, in you know, essentially uh, the, 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 a Latino ghetto in Los Angeles in a very hard area. And, uh, uh, you know, I was homeless twice. And something that's very dear to me is, um, you, know, philanthrop you know, philanthropy wise and socially is, is just, you know, I think that access to equal access to opportunity in society is, is, is really key. Like, obviously we're all kind of born differently. We have different, you know, biases and strengths and weaknesses. So, so the outcome won't, won't all be the same, but I think we should all deserve equal opportunity, right? And uh, I think one of the things that definitely makes the US great and Canada as well, is, is that there is a, a, a pretty good equal access to opportunity. And there is, uh, you know, the American dream is essentially built off social mobility, right? On, on being able to start at the bottom and climb to the top or, or kind of change the outcome of, of, of your family. Whereas, you know, my father was half British, half Indian. I come from a, a noble caste in India, meaning that no matter what we do, we'll always be a noble caste. Whereas there are people who are called in the, in, in the cast of untouchables, you know, and their families have been living in the streets for generations and they'll never get out of that. You know, Slumdog Millionaire was a movie based essentially off of that, that concept. And that exists in India, that exists in Brazil, a lot of the BRIC countries. And what they realize, especially in Brazil with the favelas, which are essentially just the Brazilian shanty towns, um, is that education and real estate were the two major drivers of social mobility. So the minute people were that were allowing people to be educated and giving them access to education, and that we're also giving them access to being property owners, all of a sudden for the first time in these places where for generations people have been stuck at the poverty level, for the first time, they started to climb out of that. So for me, that's a very powerful thing and very, very interesting. There are a lot of you know, social aspects in the US and Canada right now with affordable housing and, and various things like that. But I think that everyone deserves to access the real estate investment market because multi, especially multifamily, and this is a personal opinion. I'm not like, I'm not saying this is just a, 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 as, as veritas, but 
I think that multifamily, without a doubt, offers the best returns relative to risk compared to any other asset class. Plus the fact that you have actual control on your property because you can operate it and that it, you can actually touch that investment. For me, that, that just blows everything out of the water. And I invest in other types of assets, but for me, that, that, that multifamily asset class blows everything out of the water. It's a basic primary need. Everyone needs to live somewhere. Everyone will always need somewhere to live unless we become communists and you know they, they all take our properties for, from us. But uh, I think also everyone deserves to access that investment market. And it's a very hard market to, to access because one, there's no centralized marketplace. So if you're a newbie, how, how, how do you find properties to buy? Like if you go on the internet, there's not that much inventory. And number two, you need a lot of information, data, and education. And number three, I mean, you want to buy a five-unit property in Nashville, you're going to need, what, $100, $150,000 down payment to buy one little measly five-unit property? Diversification, and Warren Buffett said this, is not important when you know what you're doing and you master your, what you're doing. If you're buying your first five-unit property, you probably don't know anything about what you're doing and you're in the dark. So it's very hard for you to save up all that money because saving up $150,000 for the average, you know, for the average American, Canadian, European, that's a lot of dough. Like that's a lot of money to save up. So you're, it's, it's, it, it makes for this amazing asset class. It, it's so inaccessible to the everyday person. And through these tools, I want to democratize real estate investing. I want to make it easier for you guys to compete against the private equity firms and the REITs and the big monsters because you deserve to be able to compete against them. Why should they get all, why should they get all the great returns and, you know, relative to risk number one. And then I think everyone else should be able to access the market in one way or another. And I, you know, this is maybe kind of selling the punch of essentially the end goal of MREX is I eventually would like to create uh, essentially a stock market based on multifamily real estate where we take syndication and crowdfunding really to the next level and create an actual liquid market with secondary trading that my mom would be able to just say, you know what, I have a couple hundred th dollars or a thousand dollars that I've put aside. I'd like to invest in, a, in, a, in an apartment building and I don't wanna be stuck in it for seven years, not knowing what the hell's going on with the property. Or uh, I have a hundred thousand dollars to invest, but instead of buying a five unit in Nashville, well, I'd like to maybe spread 10,000 over 10 properties in 10 different cities because I need to diversify because I don't know what I'm doing. But I don't want to buy a REIT because a REIT is not real estate investing. It's a mutual fund that holds real estate properties. You'll never go in front of a property that a REIT owns as an, a REIT investor and say, I own a share of that property. No, you don't. You own the mutual, you own a, a share of the mutual fund that owns one of those properties, right? And real estate, you can't forget that part of real estate, the very tangible aspect of it is not something that we can just, you know, forget and put aside. And I think that's kind of where REITs and crowdfunding and, you know, even, even certain syndications have kind of, you know, they've kind of missed the boat on that. And that's, that's what I want to do. Like end game. That's what I want to build. I'm, I'm playing a 25 year game. You know, this is, this is not tomorrow morning. Do you, do you think any of the criticisms that things like Robin hood are getting now with the democratization of the stock market and how, it's led to, you know, exuberance and a bunch of amateur traders that are potentially just uh, inflating price absent of any fundamental analysis. Is there exposure to that for that same kind of, for the same kind of reasons that opening the floodgates to retail investors might take some of the fundamental analysis out of the game. And we're seeing it, you know, there's some argument for that right now in real estate that, you know, nothing's based on I think, I think fundamental that, analysis anymore. I think that ends up balancing itself out though. Like that, that, that's very, for me, that's very idiosyncratic and short term. Even, you know, with Robin Hood and all that, that'll eventually balance itself out. That was kind of like the robo traders, you know, five years ago. And they're like, oh, the stock market is, you know, it, it'll be changed forever. And then, you know, they, that just is, uh, there's an efficiency that's eventually attained, you know, once that novelty is over. And, you know, so I see that more as kind of cyclical. It's just that our cycles have now changed. There may be a bit less just behavioral. And now there's a technological kind of, uh, you know, flavor 
to uh, the cyclical movement of financial markets and real estate markets. So I think that ends up balancing itself out. And yeah, I mean, people will get burned, right? Because people oh, yeah. know what they're people. doing and they're getting burned. But, you know, and this is kind of, uh, uh, and this is where you, the nuance between equal access to opportunity versus equal access to outcome. No one's yeah. talking about equal access to outcome. You know, that, that's, that's, that's a whole other discussion. I'm not of that school and, and I'm not one to debate on that. My name is not Jordan Peterson or, or uh, you know, there are a couple other guys in the US who like debating on, on that with, with uh, you know, the heavy leftists. But for, for me, it's equal access to opportunity. And you know what, maybe it is a good thing and this is very not, this is not politically correct, but maybe it's a good thing you get burned. You know, I got burned as an entrepreneur ended up homeless, lost everything, lost millions. I wouldn't be half the person I am today. Absolutely. I wouldn't have half the wealth I have. I wouldn't have half the drive I have. I wouldn't have half the experience I have. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be half the person. Like socially, philanthropically, mission-based, faith-based as I am today if it wasn't for being burned. So maybe it's a good thing these people get burned with a couple thousand, a couple hundred. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I mean, it's going to hurt. But hey, at least they have equal access to opportunity. And they also have the opportunity to learn from that and become better. And I think our society is much too focused. You know, and I'm a father of three and soon four. We're way too focused. Schools are way too focused on avoiding, you know, avoiding uh, failure and avoiding, you know, all the whole exam process and the whole school process is based on avoiding failure. And I'm not saying that we should be celebrating failure. Like, you know, sometimes Silicon Valley went a bit extreme on the whole celebration of failure. I'm not saying I'm, we should be celebrating it. You know, not at all. I don't think you should aim to fail as much as you can. No, you should never aim to fail, but you shouldn't be avoiding and afraid of failure. Failure is a lesson and failure is a stepping stone if you have the right mindset to it. Yeah, and I, I, I agree completely. I mean, I think more access for more people is great. It, you still have to have responsibility for self, regardless for sure. of regardless of what opportunities you're, you're wanting it to take advantage of. It can be the wild, wild west, and that's why we have organizations like the SEC and FINRA, you know, who essentially, uh, you know, uh, organize and, and enforce that, you know, there's not a whole bunch of crazy stuff going. There's not, you know, concepts like KYC, which is know your client, AML, anti-money laundering. I think these are all great things. And, you know, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm definitely striving and working to eventually build a platform that will, you know, be fully, you know, compliant and a member of all those organizations. I don't think we should do it. You know, this whole right now, like I'm also very much into blockchain and kind of crypto. And uh, I, I kind of laugh, I, I find it funny, uh, it, it, and it's okay, you know, because it, it pushes evolution, but I don't believe in the whole kind of, you know, crypto punk space of everything should be decentralized and no government and no, no legislation and no nothing like that. I think extremes are always dangerous, you know, and we're in a very divisive, uh, you know, age right now where everyone's kind of on one extreme or the other. And I'm just like, you know, maybe we should all kind of just come back into the middle a little bit and, you know, temper all this craziness. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about uh, like hype versus actionable content. So we, so kind of it, it goes back. I think feeds into the the holistic approach to to the life cycle of an investment, or, or even just helping delineate when you're looking at content, which there is a ton of it out there. Oh Deci deciphering, you know, what is useful, what is not useful, and maybe not buying into the hype as much because I'm hugely cynical <laughs> on a lot of content. I'm like, there, I'm like, I wish there was a social media long form platform because yeah. I'm like, you know, I'm like, yeah, we can get into this, but. I don't want to, you know, have notifications for the rest of my life right. based on three sentence responses going back and forth. So you're very good about like long form content, even on what I consider short form uh, platforms. Um, and I'll, I'll preface it with like this is like, I look at some stuff and I, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's, I don't know what that's really telling me. I, I tend to think about, well, what's it not telling me? So yeah. 
uh, you know, kind of take it from there. What are your thoughts on just absorbing well, all of this stuff? I think, I think like social media has been a great thing where it's opened the path for people like myself, you know, where maybe I would not have been able to share as much as I can share. And I think I have a lot to share and I also have a lot to learn. And I, as I continue to learn, I keep on sharing it and I'm adding on to what I'm doing. I'm still probably, you know, I, 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 I put anyone to the challenge who reads as many books and research and data as myself. And I'm at a point in my career where, I mean, I could just wing it like seriously, like I've, you know, I, I've, I've passed that 10,000 hour mark a long time ago, like of, of, of mastery of my, of my industry. Um, but I think w- what's happened as well is it's given a voice to a bunch of people that don't like have no business whatsoever having a voice. It's created all this noise. And, you know, I was kind of shooting on Gary V earlier and I love Gary V. I think, you know, I think he's a brilliant guy. And I think a lot of stuff he t- the, says is taken out of context, but uh, I think a lot of people misunderstood a lot of what he said. And now everyone's like producing all this content and what they're doing is just reproducing what everyone else is producing, which is just a reproduction. Like I said earlier, it's just that we're back in the whole chimp sphere, right? So it's, it, it becomes very tough for, you know, a newbie investor, even for an experienced investor to cut through all that noise and that, you know, just that, that dra- that constant dram of, of crap that's out there and po- polluting, you know, our, our, our focus and polluting our time and energy. And that's, that's essentially why I spend so much time on social media and producing content because there's no one enforcing that. And I grew up as a very idealistic person. You know, my, my, my great, great grandfather, my great grandfather essentially was one of the backers of Gandhi in India when they kicked the British out. And my family in India, you know, for, for many generations was involved in a lot of movements, the, the Brahmo Samai movement that essentially, uh, you know, move kind of Brahminism to evolve out of the, the very nasty and, 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 you know, downgrading ways of treating women in India. My family was always very kind of at the forefront of that, those social movements. So I think it's very ingrained in me. I always feel an obligation to enforce if no one else is enforcing, even though it's not my responsibility, because I think as a, as a, as a citizen, it is our responsibility. You know, if I go, if I'm walking downtown one night and in a back alley, I see, you know, three dudes trying to, you know, beat up another dude or, or, or you know, trying to uh, abuse a woman, even if it puts my life in danger and it, it doesn't regard me, I'll be the first to run in and beat the shit out of those guys and risk my life, essentially. So I think the same thing it kind of goes, and I know that's an extreme kind of parallel, but I, I like imaging things a lot. Uh, that's why I, I, I you know, put my personal time into, into social media. And I like that you said deciphering real estate. I, actually, I think it, probably by the time this podcast will have dropped, I'll have dropped a new series on, our, on the MREX College's YouTube channel, which is my most popular series in French. It's called Deciphering Real Estate. And what I do is I take about 20 minutes with a whiteboard and I take a very specific concept and I decipher it. And I do exactly what you said, you know, what is this telling me? But what is this also not telling me? And how should I think about that? And that's why I think, you know, content is great. Education is great. But once again, that doesn't allow you to de-responsibilize yourself from the obligation of thinking about what's being fed to you. You know, it, it's like the old analogy of TV because TV said it, it's true. No, it's not. And yeah. because some dude wrote an article or a post on Facebook or said in a podcast, I hope everyone challenges what I'm saying. Like, seriously, I hope, and I'm open to it. I want people to challenge me because, you know, number one, if I am right, it'll allow me to, to define that, that, that position even more and, and be able to even better communicate it to the next people I'm talking about it. And if I am wrong, well, I'm happy to be wrong. It's like failing because it'll help me be even more right after. And it'll help me think about new ways of doing things and, and thinking through problems and becoming essentially a better investor. And that's all you can strive to be as an investor, whether it be as a syndicator, as a GP, as an LP, as a person who does joint ventures, as a person who just buys your own properties. That's the only thing you can strive to is to always every day be a better investor. Yeah, because I mean, you know, sure that answer the question. I, I kind of it went does because <laughs> you know, let's take the inflation thing. It's like oh, everybody's talking about inflation. You know, there's three possibilities: it's going to go up, yep, 
it's going to stay the same yeah. or it's going to go down. Yeah. So if you're like, I think it's going to go up. All okay, right. You might be right. You have a 33% chance. Right. If it stays the same, nobody's going to really call you out on it because you weren't wrong enough. And if you're wrong, everybody's already forgotten about your post. And I'm certain you're probably not going to write a retraction. No. So I see shit like that. And I'm just like, great. Uh, predict World War Three for me on the day that's going to happen when something is really going to move the needle. Because otherwise, we're just like, you're, you're taking a two and three chance of, no, of nobody calling you out on well, and I think that's, that's you know, your prediction. Lot. I think that's the problem with a lot of the content out there. It's just, it's just posturing, right? Like, yeah, like, it's just posturing. Like, what's the point of all this? Like, and that's why whenever I try to post, you know, on Facebook or LinkedIn or, or write articles and, and, uh, or do things on YouTube, I'm, I'm a human being. I have an ego too. So sometimes I probably posture as well. And I'm, you know, I'm fine with that. I try not posture, but as much as possible, I try and everything I do is either to get you to think or because I'm actually trying to think through something like, and I'm just sharing it out loud. Right. I think that's mm -hmm. kind of where, you know, if, if I take the advice that Gary V gave to people is like produce content, but he also said you have to produce massive content. But if your content is shit, it's not worth anything. And I think a lot of people forgot that kind of part. Of, you know, <laughs> you know, that's where I think it was kind of taken out of context what, what he said in the past. I, I like the fact the statement you just made in regards to it's either to try to get you to think or to help myself think through something. <laughs> and it's probably the latter both times. So if someone comes yeah. back to you with either, hey Nikolai, have you thought about this? Yep. You're either going to shoot it down based on what you already know. Or you're going to go, oh, and then you're continuing to learn on that particular well, I, topic. I always try to think about it before shooting it down to kind of question myself. It, you know, is this, is this, you know, is this very toss or is it not, right? And I, I think, look, you're right. 90, for myself, I can't speak for everyone else. For myself, probably 99% of the stuff I write is really for myself. <laughs> I'm just saying it with you guys. Oh, uh, yeah, you're just thinking it yeah. through and, <laughs> and typing it. Yeah, yeah, that's great because... Uh... Oh, I appreciate it. That's for sure. Yeah, I don't know. I, I hate to be so cynical about it all. I actually, I don't mind being so cynical about it all. But um, well, I, yeah, you I, use it for what it's worth. You know, don't rely on it for information. You know, yeah. reconfirm it. You know, it's I, I, I it's curated yeah, confirmation it. virus. You know, it's posturing. I, I get it. Like you know, you're starting off as a syndicator, so you chose to produce content and whatnot that, that's fine you know no judgment there but at least you know i get some people arguing with me and th there was this one syndicator from texas uh and she thought she was like big the big big fish like really big big fish and uh she starts arguing with me and she's just like way wrong like it's and i'm i'm always one to question what i'm doing and you know to play devil's advocate even with myself and she's just like off She's off her rockers and people are investing in this lady like nonstop. I'm like, damn, I'm not letting this go. Like, seriously, I, I just can't let it go. And you can be wrong, but you know, know when you're wrong, you know, know when you're wrong and be, be, you know, have enough integrity to, to say, you know what, maybe I am wrong. Let's talk about this. And if I am, maybe I'll reposition myself. You know what? There's nothing that, that, that would make, I think there's nothing that shows that you're a person of integrity and that you can be trusted than doing that. And, uh, and what's, just, what, what's a shame is everyone doesn't want, all these syndicators and investors don't want to do that because they're stuck in their ego and they have no real self-esteem. So they're afraid that if they do say, oh, you know what? You might be right about that. I might be wrong about it. Let me rethink that. They think that they're going to look like a less investor or less a lesser syndicator, and then people won't invest with them or back them anymore. When in reality, it's the opposite. People would invest in them way more. And, you know, I have people running after me to give me money, like literally, like tens of millions of dollars. If I wanted tomorrow morning, I could raise $100 million like that. That's not what yeah. I do. That's not, that's not what I'm focused on. And that comes, why? Because of integrity, you know? Integrity and authenticity, you just touched on it. You're not a fellow, you're not afraid to share with others as evidenced during this interview right now. I've been homeless twice. I had to pick myself up 
That's real. And I yeah. have an ego. Uh, I have an ego. I haven't attenuated 100% of my ego. And sure. sometimes my posture, and sometimes I'm an yeah. asshole, and sometimes I make mistakes, but I... Well, at least I, I own, you know, I own them. <laughs> Correct. And I, and, and I, and I've told people in front of a crowd, I lost $56,000 in my first multifamily property trying to do everything on my own, thinking I knew everything. Yep. And I had some people come up to me after that saying, J just wanted to get to know you. The point about the content, kind of circling back to the content is I want to speak for Greg and I, but maybe I shouldn't. I think Greg and I just put out enough content to stay relevant because I think we've learned, I'll just, so personally, I've learned that people like me for me, because you because you are authentic and it's generally the one-on-one -on -one in-person phone call yeah. or whatnot. It's and not content not, that makes people like Aaron. content trying to posture as me, right? And that's where I think a lot of people get confused. I see all these, you know, young syndicators or, or new syndicators putting out content and faking it till they make it, till they make it, and posturing and trying to act as if they're someone like me or someone who has my experience and my knowledge base. That's that's a mistake. Put out you, and that's what that that's valuable. You, you know, even if you've never done a deal, you could probably put out very very. I mean, someone probably could have never done a deal and put out very great content if they're putting out the content that they should be putting out and not trying to pretend that they're a goddamn expert in something they're not, right? Right. Or you can know something without being an expert. Well, then act as someone who knows something, but who knows they're not at that expert level, that level 10 yet. They might be at that level seven or eight or nine, which is great, or six, but put out the content as that. Don't put out that content as, as if you are that level 10, right? And that's kind of why everyone's kind of just spinning what everyone else says, because they they're not being themselves and they're trying to put out, they're trying to put out a level 10 when they're not level 10. And they think they're putting out level 10s, but they're putting out stuff of level sixes who are pretending to be level 10s. Yeah, most mm -hmm. of the level 10 people aren't putting out any content at all. We're, we're, we're very, very <laughs> few. I mean, Peter Lineman, Lineman puts out a bit of content. Uh, uh, Dr. Mueller out of Denver, you know, every six months puts out a bit of content, uh, you know, uh, Prof Geltner from MIT puts out a bit of content here and there. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm not in the academic world, so I'm more in the private world. So I'm more incentivized to put out more content than say those guys. Yeah, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of other ones, and, yeah. and you know, I think they're even way th theoretically much more advanced than I am. But practically, I am probably more advanced than they are. And there are other much more advanced people than me. You know, practically, there are guys running huge funds and REITs and they're not putting out content because they have no incentivization to do it. They're too damn busy. Yeah, they're too damn busy. <laughs> and, don't you know, need to. Or they don't have that social aspect ingrained in them, which is fine. Yeah. Like that, that you don't have to have that. Like, I mean, sometimes I wish I did. I wish sometimes, you know, instead of putting out so much content, I just go chill by the lake and, you know, yeah. you know, smoke a, fat, smoke a fat doozy now that it's legal here, you know? <laughs> you got one more maybe mindset type question, just going back to um, your uh, what was the physical training, optimum high Yep. Human performance. Human performance. Thank you, Darren. Yeah. Human performance is all in your mind. And you know, yeah, I was, that's what I was going to say to me, that sounded initially like very physiology. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's how much mental crossover is there I, I, from, I, from, from the athlete to yeah. the business. I, I've competed against great athletes. You know, I played hockey. I was a professional ice hockey player. I played with Cindy Crosby, who was, you know, arguably one of the top yeah. players of history. Uh, I played with guys more talented than Cindy Crosby like way more talented and you'd never know their names because it's, it's mental. And I was not that talented. I started skating at the age of 10. Most Canadians start skating at three. My son started at a year and a half, you know, by the age of 10 there, you already, you already know they're going to be NHL players. I, at 10, I didn't know how to skate at 16. You know, I was at the elite level nationally as a junior player. Why mindset mentality, and the one mentality that beats everything, 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 everything. I think it was Will Smith who said that in an interview a couple of maybe five or 10 years ago. It really stuck with me because that's kind of how I see the world and how I've always tried to tra train athletes. And I've worked with, you know, I I've worked with international, you know, intercontinental champions in boxing, pro boxing. I've worked with football players. I've worked with, you know, all the type of Olympic athletes in the winter sports. The one thing that separates the average from the exceptional is mindset. 
And the mindset that Will Smith talked about, I think that really pervades it the best is if me and you get into a competition, let's say we get in, uh, onto a treadmill, me and you, and I'm, I'm fat now, like I'm not in a, any type of athletic shape that I used to be. If I get into a competition, even with someone who's very, still very athletic, and let's say it's for the safety of my children or for my business or for being the best I can be in my profession, I'm going to win. I can tell you right now, I'll win. You're going to fucking die before I get off. I'm going to be blooding and pissing and shitting myself. My eyes are going to be closed. I'm going to be hallucinating. I ain't giving up. You're going to give up way before me. I'm going to break you. That's how you should live life. And that doesn't have to be towards the other person. It can be towards the little bitch inside of your head. <laughs> Podcast yeah, that, over. Yeah, that's great, man. Yeah. yeah, we let's leave it there. There's nothing I can say that'll do better than that. So no, I, mean, uh, I, don't, I think I was I think I was I was I was going through a moment of flow there. <laughs> no, that's oh, great. You know, it's uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh Man, I just I appreciate you coming on. Uh, had several conversations. Now I'm looking forward to get, getting reengaged because it's been a long time, man. I, I just just hearing you talk about all that stuff just tells me so much more about who you are as a human, and mindset's huge to me. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you guys. It was it was a pleasure, and uh, we'll do this again for sure. And and we'll also do it in person too with a with a yeah yeah. With so lots we'll, of bourbon. <laughs> we'll drop so, all your stuff in the show notes. I know MREX has got some stuff coming out, some stuff that we'll yeah. Do you want to you want to next year? You want to give out any contact info? Uh, pretty easy to find me. I'm on you know Nikolai Ray. There aren't many of us, so uh, right. you know, guy with you know tan skin, and who, who likes to speak a lot. Uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. I'm pretty, pretty active. Uh, Emrex College is more and more active on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, even TikTok, I think, and uh, YouTube. Yeah, especially YouTube. That's where we're, we're going to be putting out a lot of content. So subscribe to the Emrex College's YouTube channel and believe me, you won't regret yeah, it. Yeah, I recommend the YouTube channel. Uh, check in every now and then. And yeah, you put out some really good videos, very well thought out. And they're, they're all seem to be just almost stream of consciousness. You know, there's you get on a subject. There's an English and a French channel. So if yeah, English, yeah. Make, sure, make sure you subscribe to the English one because the French one, you won't understand anything. <laughs> yeah, so. All right, I'll take us out, Darren. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Real Life Solutions Podcast. Hope you enjoyed uh, our talk with Nikolai Ray. If there's a uh, Somebody you think would benefit directly from this conversation, please take a moment to share with them. And always, uh, we appreciate you subscribing as well. So Nikolai, thanks again, Darren. Uh, I'm sure I'll run into you later today somewhere and we'll see the rest of you on the next episode. Mm -hmm.